Marcus Garvey was way ahead of his time. Way ahead of his time. For a little black man from St. Dan to rise upon them level there. Up to this day with us, you know, black man from this part of the world do these things. You know, I mean, every Pan-Africanist in the diaspora here is influenced by Marcus Garvey. And we talk about every woman, including Elijah Muhammad, where we would say Elijah Muhammad rose to be one of the most influential um, black men in America. Elijah Muhammad influenced Malcolm X, Farrakhan and all these men. Yet Elijah Muhammad was influenced by Marcus Garvey. You know, so Marcus Garvey, you know, all the way here. Want to give thanks for such a spirit, such a spirit enter the world and still is here with us. So we hope that a whole heap of ones who out there, who hear about Marcus Garvey, knowing that Marcus Garvey is the first national hero, it is very important, especially the youth, them right now is an holiday. Very important that you go out there and try to gather as much information as possible about this man. Because in his philosophy, in his going about talking about black liberation and black development, black dignity, he has enhanced a lot of black people's life. And it's just because of his, what you call, fundamentalist principle that guided him when he said race first, why a whole heap of people seem not to want to gravitate towards his philosophy but it is still relevant very relevant in this time that we understand and accept what marcus garvey was projecting and portraying the white world may despise us the white world may scoff and spurn the idea of a free africa because they say how oh dare you talk about africa when africa is in the position of england when Africa is in the possession of France, when Africa is in the possession of Spain. What logic have you, Mr. White Man? Have you not before you the pages of history recording the rise and fall of peoples, of races and of nations? White Man, can you not learn by experience? Why talk about the permanency of Great Britain in Africa? Why talk about the permanency of France in Africa? How long do you suppose the colored people got to suffer in this land? I pray that God will send the Moses to lead us out of this land. These are words, at least the first words about Marcus Garvey talking about, talking to white people, if they're not learning from history, that nations rise and nations fall. There was a time in history when the great city of Babylon had the splendor and riches any nation wanted. Even one of the seven wonders of the world, they said the hanging, the hanging gardens of Babylon was a sight to be old. But Babylon was destroyed. Babylon fell. Babylon fell. Then we had the great nation of Greece. Greece. Greece where they claim uh, where they stole, the Greeks stole philosophies and science from Egypt. But Greece rose to be one of the superpowers of the world. Greece philosophy is part of the structure of Western civilization. It is Greek philosophy that uphold and maintain the philosophy religiously of Western civilization. But Greek fell. Greek fell. And then we see Rome rise. And Rome gave us the Caesars. And the Caesars rose, and the Caesars fall, and Rome fell. The fall of the Roman Empire is documented. When Rome 
was the world power, the superpower. We are living in this life now. We hear about America as a superpower. But there was a time in history when the only superpower you had was Rome. But Rome fell. Rome fell. It is said that even one of the emperors, Nero, Emperor Nero fiddled while Rome burned. Then we see England rose. Great Britain, the colonizers of many countries and many states and many islands. We see Great Britain rise. And we used to sing about Great Britain rising. The Queen of England as our crown up to this day. We still recognize her as the head of state of our country. But we see Great Britain is not great anymore. We see the demise of Great Britain. No people just call it England. No more Great Britain, just England. But the power of Great Britain was given over to the United Snakes of America. The United Snakes of America is said to be right now the only superpower because Russia fell. The end of the Cold War. So America is sitting there on its pedestal, waving its scepter across the earth as the only superpower on earth. But nation rise and nation fall. And it's just time, and it's just a matter of time. When America will fall, we don't have doubt about that. America will fall. But we ask the question, at what period was Africa in its glory? Was there any African glory? Was Africa always slavery? Was Africa always suffocation? Was Africa always AIDS, famine, drought? disease was Africa always this will we ever again see a Africa that is like unto Greece like unto Babylon like unto Rome like unto Great Britain and like unto America will we ever see a Africa like that again well we want to tell the people that the strength of every nation lies in the power of the people and the dignity and the resourcefulness of those people. And the only way that Africa will rise again to its former glory is if the people now recognize themselves as true Africans and as people who held up the world like Atlas holding up the world and returned to that supreme dignity that was once us. God truly, if you study history, you will know that before Greece, before Rome, before Britain, before America, before Babylon, Africa exalted in knowledge, power, science, and technology. Africa was once a superpower. And we say that what goes around must come around. Christopher Columbus never knew that, but we know that. And what goes around comes around. Because so it was in the beginning. So shall it be now. And it is left up to we as a people, as black people, conscious people who know our spirituality and who know that we exist even through lynching, even through murder, genocide, even through famine, even through AIDS, even through drought, even through anything that the European world has placed in front of us as obstacle. 
even through slavery. And after 500 years of slavery, we are still here to tell the tales. And our ancestors' blood, our genetic memory, keep us intact, even through suffocation and drugs, even through pestilence and famine. Our genetic memory is what is keeping us. So we all we have to do now is to use that genetic memory, that memory that tells us that Africa is great, that Marcus Garvey stood for Africa, liberation, Africa redemption, and place all our being in this liberation process. Because when Africa is free, all human beings will be free. And if Africa is not free, no man can truly say that he is free. So the freedom of the entire human race is depending on the liberation and freedom of Africa. Because Africa is the mother of civilization. Africa is the mother of civilization. And if Africa is not free, no man anywhere on earth can truly say that he is free whether economically, politically, and socially. So if them think that they're going to put AIDS and famine and drought and disease and all these things on Africa and feel so they're going to get rid of the African race to rise up themselves, they're making a sad mistake because history don't show us that. And we learn from history. We learn from the root of the tree that without the root, the tree cannot exist. And if you don't maintain the root, if you don't nurture the root and nourish the root, you could have made the root have no water a little more. You could have made the root, the root, you could have chopped the root a little more. One little straw on a root make the old tree survive. So no matter how you're hearing about these AIDS and these drought and these pestilence and diseases in Africa, the root still exists. Because the people exist all over the earth. So we declare that Marcus Garvey work must can. We can truly see some semblance of Pan-Africanism in this part of the world. And we give thanks to the Rastafari movement over the years who have maintained Marcus Garvey's spirit in their psyche who have really go out there and say, look here, there is a man from St. Anne that need to be recognized named Marcus Mosiah Garvey, and we will not stop declaring this man in this part of the world. No, we will never stop doing that, because we know and we understand what Marcus Garvey stood for over the years, over the century, 113 years of Marcus Garvey. Garvey live forever in the hearts and minds of the Pan-African movement and all black people who seek freedom for the human species. It is all about Marcus Garvey, you know. Over the years, people have been crying and begging and saying, why are they not teaching Marcus Garvey in schools? I remember I visited a library and I was talking in this library and there was no Marcus Garvey. There was nothing about Marcus Garvey in the library itself. You know, I mean, we see Buster Manti picture paint up on the wall and all these things. We see, we see Manly, Norman Manly picture up on the wall. We never really see none in either, but Marcus Garvey, I don't know no other hero. I don't know no other man out unless it's Bob Marley. The two most popular Jamaicans I know is Marcus Garvey and Bob Marley. And Bob Marley was influenced by Marcus Garvey. So we have to give the credit to Marcus Garvey as the most influential Jamaican ever live. But then, when we look at the Ministry of Culture and the Ministers of Information in Jamaica, they seem not to... Every time you keep saying this thing, you know, we, I, I get tired of this. I get tired of telling them about why well, they don't teach Marcus Garvey in school. I think, say, we who know that this should be done should do it subtly or otherwise. You know, we should take the responsibility to even incorporate in our teachings Marcus Garvey's teachings and not wait on these guys 
who do have no interest of black people in them hand to really talk about Marcus Garvey because Marcus Garvey is obviously a threat to them social order. Marcus Garvey is directly a threat to them social order. So if they start to talk about the philosophy of Marcus Garvey, I don't know what they're afraid of. It is all about Africa and it's all about black people and the struggle that black people go through and a man who had articulated and not only articulated it but helped to motivate 20 million people right around the world towards an African, pan-Africanist struggle. You know, Marcus Garvey is responsible for the influence of one of the, the first truly independent prime ministers of Africa, Ghana, Kwame Nkrumah. You know, to this day, the black star is still printed in the, in the, in the flag of Ghana. You know, we don't, we don't know why is it that these guys always make the profit is without honor in his own country. You know, this is one of the heroes that white people still don't heal. Yes, this is one of the heroes. We have the most popular black man that white people don't heal. When they heal Bob Marley, they don't heal Marcus Garvey up to now, you know. Because Marcus Garvey is in a class by himself. Marcus Garvey is for black people without a doubt. It's for black people. No doubt about that. So whenever I hear them, I said this and I said that and I said this. It is all about Marcus Garvey. are going to give you a tip about the women in the Marcus Garvey movement. Um, recently we did an interview with, with Robert Hill. We played it early on in the year talking about Marcus Garvey and we also last year this time too we did do an interview with Tony Martin you know talking about you know the history of Marcus Garvey. Well I, I don't remember if we had played this before but I don't think so but this is a very interesting tape, Tony Martin talking about the women in the Marcus Garvey movement. This is the cutting edge and I refer him. It's a Garvey's organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, was of course the largest pan-African movement, the largest international mass movement that our people have produced. It is my feeling that our radical movements, you know, as black people, have usually tended to give a greater role to, to women than those of perhaps other groups of people. And the UNIA was no exception. Women, it seems to me, were fairly, fairly well integrated throughout the length and breadth of the UNIA at all levels of the organization. There was no specific feminist rhetoric in a modern contemporary sense, I do not think. So one has to look more at the practice and deduce what the situation was from the practice. And it seems to me that if one looks at the practice, that the UNIA stands up very well against contemporary organizations and against more recent you know, organizations in terms of the roles that women played. Gavi himself had some close relations with women in his own family you know, long before he began the UNIA. He seems to have been particularly close to his mother. He seems to have had some problems with his father, who he considered stern. His mother he described as a saintly woman, too good for the time in which she lived. And as I recall, Mrs. Amy Jakes Garvey, in her biography of her husband, mentions that when Garvey moved to Kingston in his late teenage years, that he sent for his mother, brought her to Kingston with him from St. Anne's, and that she died here in Kingston. Garvey had one sister, Indiana. All his other siblings died, you know, in infancy, I believe. And he seems to have had a reasonably good relationship with his sister as well. His sister apparently helped uh, take him to, to England, at least helped, you know, finance to some extent. His trip to England around about 1912. His sister apparently preceded Garvey to England. His sister also lived in the Garvey household for a time in the early 1920s in New York City. So Gavi, one might possibly argue, brought to the UNIA this sort of personal experience of fairly close relations with the two major women in his immediate family circle. But the first member of the UNIA in 1914, in the summer of 1914, 
Shortly after Garvey had returned from England, the first member of the UNIA apparently was a woman, a very young woman, Amy Ashwood, who in due course would become Amy Ashwood Garvey, the first wife of Marcus Garvey. She was only 17 years old. She has described her own role as that of a co-founder. I, I guess that one could perhaps consider her a co-founder. She may possibly have been exaggerating somewhat because she actually met Garvey just a few days before the UNIA was founded. But she certainly was apparently the first member of the UNIA. Her mother, interestingly enough, also became involved in the work of the UNIA during that early period here in Kingston. This is between August 1914 and March 1916 when Garvey left to go to the United States of America. Quite a few other women played very active roles in the UNIA in that initial period. I've seen a list of the original executive of the UNIA here in Kingston, and almost half of the members apparently were women. One of them was Garvey's sister, Indiana. She was involved at the very beginning. From the very beginning, the UNIA had a practice of having lady secretaries in each division, as the locals were called, divisions. Later on, there would be lady presidents as well. But even though there were various positions set aside specifically for women, this did not preclude the appointment of women to regular positions at the very highest levels of the party also at the same time. Now, for the first year or two of the UNIA here in Jamaica, the UNIA was very much in the tradition of Caribbean social welfare organizations. In fact, I'm very fascinated by the kinds of activities that the UNIA indulged in here in Jamaica in 1914, 15, and 16. They were in many ways indistinguishable from the types of activities that so many of our social organizations have indulged in. They held concerts, they held fundraising activities, they fed the poor, they visited the hospitals, talked to the sick, they had a treat for the poor of Kingston at Christmas time, they were trying to set up a school, an industrial school. They tried to run a, a labor bureau, finding jobs for unemployed persons and so on. And um, occasionally, at the, various, at the various concerts and so on that they would have on a weekly basis, topics pertaining to women would be discussed. One of the prime activities of the group in this early period was um, holding debates. They, they, to some extent, they were almost a debating society apart from everything else. And a couple of the early debates were on topics of interest to, you know, um, to women. For example, one of the earliest debates apparently was on the topic, quote, is the intellect of women as highly developed as that of man's? That was a debate topic. Now, Marcus Garvey himself participated in that debate, and I'm happy to say that Garvey argued for the affirmative that is, that the intellect of women was, you know, was as highly developed as that of men. On another occasion, and again, this is very early here in Kingston, on another occasion the topic was, quote, women or men, whose influence is more felt in the world? I did not make a note of, um, of what was the outcome of, of, of this particular debate, but it, it does, does show a certain concern for these kinds of questions, even though, as I mentioned earlier, I'm not aware of any specific feminist rhetoric in a modern contemporary uh, sense. Once the UNIA relocated to New York City in 1916 and Garvey had time to settle down and organize, you found again that women tended to play an integral role, a fairly well integrated role in the movement. Some of the highest positions in the UNIA in the, in the US were actually held by women. The best known of these women is Henrietta Vinton Davis, a woman who had been an associate of uh, Frederick Douglass, the great Afro-American leader, many years before. A woman who was a, an orator, a Shakespearean actor, actress, and who had actually toured Jamaica some years um, earlier. She might perhaps have had contact with Garvey in Jamaica, I'm, I'm not sure, Henrietta Vinton Davis. At various points, and she had a very long career in the UNIA. At, at various points, she was a, a vice president. There was, there was a first vice president, a second vice president, and so on, and she was a vice president on various occasions. For, for quite a while, she was an international organizer, one of the highest positions within the UNIA. And significantly enough, another woman 
later held that same post of international organizer, a woman that they referred to as Madame Dimina. Several of the high-ranking members in other departments of the UNIA were women. For example, in the early 20s, one of the main persons in what Garvey called the Negro Factories Corporation was a woman. The Negro Factories Corporation ran a string of businesses because one of Garvey's main ideas was that of self-reliance. And so he sought to demonstrate that black people could do things for themselves successfully. And so one of the businesses that the UNIA ran in Harlem was a printing press. And a very young woman was actually the head of that printing press. Her name was Lillian Galloway. I'm not sure what her background was. I have seen photographs of her taken around 1922. And judging from the photographs, she couldn't have been more than about 30 years old or so. A very young woman to be holding such a responsible position in this great organization. Gavi had international conventions on an annual basis. For his first convention in 1920, something like 25,000 people turned out at Madison Square Garden in New York City. And sometimes at those conventions, there would be special emphasis placed on the accomplishments of women within the race. There was what Gavi called a woman's day sometimes at the conventions, when artwork and literature and so on produced by women would be on display, and when famous women would make appearances. I was very interested to see that uh, Marian Anderson, the famous contralto singer, Afro-American, sang at Women's Day at one of those UNIA conventions around about 1921, 22 or thereabouts. Many of Garvey's concerns, his ships, his universities, his schools, were often named after famous members of the race. And here again we see um, one of his ships, Phyllis Wheatley, being named after one of Afro-America's major figures, Phyllis Wheatley, Afro-America's second poet, Afro-America's first woman poet, and I believe the United States of America's second poet, period, white or black. Gavi also came into contact in an, in an intimate way with some fairly well-known women who were not in the UNIA per se. For example, in 1918, as Gavi was still moving around the country, building the infrastructure of the organization, establishing contact with Afro-American leaders. One of the leaders who he came in contact with was Ida Wells Barnett. Ida Wells Barnett is a very important name in Afro-American history for all kinds of reasons. She was a pioneer in the women's club movement among Afro-Americans. She was a pioneer member of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. Although she did not remain in it very long, she was disenchanted with it. But she is perhaps best known for being a major figure in the campaign against lynching. Lynching being one of the most heinous crimes that any civilized society has had to deal with, whereby black people in the States were killed in the streets almost on a, on a daily basis. And Ida Wells Barnett for many years was a major campaigner in the crusade against lynching. And she actually came to Garvey's uh, Liberty Hall, his meeting place in Harlem, and delivered a speech there in 1918. So he must have had some fairly, you know, reasonably close contact with her. She lived in Chicago, so coming to New York meant a fairly major undertaking on her part in those days when one would have to travel by, by train. Gavi also came into contact, close contact with Madame C.J. Walker, another major figure in Afro-American history. Madame C.J. Walker was a cosmetologist. She is normally considered to have been Afro-America's first millennia, at least first female millennia. And perhaps you might think of her as a somewhat unlikely person, perhaps, to be friendly with Garvey. But the fact is that Madame Walker, despite her riches, never lost her race consciousness. And so she was involved in one or two radical organizations herself. And she didn't think anything of funding organizations for racial uplift. And so Madame Walker was somebody that Garvey admired, and, and, and she um, invited Garvey to a meeting she had in 1919 when she was trying to found an organization, a Pan-African type organization, which, among other things, wanted to send black delegates to the peace conference, which was coming up in, in, in our Versailles in, in Paris after the First World War. There was one occasion when Gavi allowed very unusually, perhaps, but allowed a, a white communist woman, Rose Pastor Stokes, to address the UNIA convention. There was a communist cadre within the UNIA who wanted this woman to speak and Garvey allowed her to speak, even though he um, did not 
you know, fall victim to her entreaties that he become a communist and so on. But he gave her a hearing and then proceeded to explain that she was free to say what she wanted because the UNIA was a democratic organization, but that he wasn't about to surrender his race first organization, you know, for any uh, communists. The UNIA had a variety of auxiliaries. There were auxiliaries for youth, auxiliaries for women, auxiliaries, you know, um, for military factions within the party and so on. And one of the most powerful and popular and best known of the auxiliaries was the Black Cross Nurses, an all-women's organization. And on the banner behind there, you can see a lovely graphic uh, depicting Black Cross Nurses on parade. But that's a very, uh, very well-known photograph. I think it was taken during one of Garvey's international conventions. Garvey's international conventions were preceded by a lengthy parade. In 1920, the parade was 10 miles long. One might perhaps expect to have a woman's auxiliary for nurses. That's a traditional female occupation, you might say. More surprising, perhaps, might be the fact, and this, I'm sure, must be indicative of, of Garvey's attitude to the woman question, is the fact that Garvey also had a paramilitary auxiliary for women. There were two paramilitary organizations in Garvey's movement. One was the Universal African Legions, which was male, and the other one was the Universal African Motor Corps, which was female. So here were women obtaining military training, dressed in military uniform. And this has to be highly in advance of anything in Garvey's time or since, because I know of no other major organization, mass movement in the States, black or white, that has had a female paramilitary, paramilitary group. In fact, in recent times, that's one of the things I recall some of the feminists talking about, you know, insisting on, on um, being uh, conscripted into the army and what have you. Now, Garvey was a black nationalist. He preached the doctrine of race first, self-reliance, and nationhood. And the woman question was intimately involved in the race first question. Race first meant that black folk would have to put their racial self-interest first. Garvey argued that all races did it, and black people might as well do it too. Garvey told black people, among other things, that they must take down the white pinups from their walls. He was against the gross advertisements for, for skin whiteness and so on that used to adorn the newspapers of that generation. He encouraged, in fact, he himself, through his organization, established a factory for making black dolls so that young black children would not have to deal with the question of of our beauty being seen, you know, through the um, eyes of, you know, white folk all the time. And so Gavi was against intermarriage to a large extent. He was against miscegenation. Now, he wasn't against light-skinned people, as some people have argued. He said that this happened to us during slavery, there's nothing we could do about it now. But he was against continuing this practice now that slavery was over. And he was particularly upset, as he mentioned in one early article that he wrote, Considering the question of, as he put it, which black men marrying poor white women. He argued, and this, this was a very early article, but he argued here that in the case of Jamaica, that very often black men were poor, their parents sacrificed, sent them away to study, they became doctors or what have you. They came back to Jamaica, brought a white wife with them, then they died, and the money which they had accumulated through the hard work of the race then went back to the white race when the wife went back to Scotland or Wales or wherever she came from. Garvey actually promoted, you know, he provided an alternative to the white pinups that he denounced by, by uh, having in the Negro world his newspaper photographs of a beautiful black woman so that black folk would have an alternative. I think it's instructive to, to contrast the situation of black women in Garvey's movement being, you know, exalted into a position of, of eminence with a similar, with well, a different situation that existed at least um, as expressed by a famous black woman who was in the Communist Party in the U.S. I'm referring here to Claudia Jones, a famous black woman in the Communist Party in the States in the 1940s and early 50s. And she once wrote an article in Political Affairs, the theoretical journal of the Communist Party of the USA, in which she lamented the position a black woman in the Communist Party. She pointed out that white men in the Communist Party, once the revolution was over and the time came to socialize, that white men didn't have a problem because they had the white women in the party to socialize with. She claimed that the white women in the party didn't have a problem because they had the white men in the party to socialize with and the black men in the party as well. 
The black men didn't have any problem because when the revolution was over, after a hard day's revolution, when they, when they got back to the party headquarters, they could socialize with the white women. But the black women in the party, she said, they were the ones, you know, who were left out. There was, there was nobody for them to deal with. And that kind of a situation would have been unthinkable in Garvey's movement. Garvey himself waxed poetic on more than one occasion on a question of, of black women. His famous poem on a black woman begins, Black Queen of Beauty, thou hast given color to the world. And it continues in that fashion. He goes on to say in the poem that time was when the black woman was the, you know, the queen, the queen of nations and so on. When um, people like Caesar and Antony, he's referring to the Cleopatra story here, and other figures in antiquity, you know, um, paid deference and so on to the black woman. He says that the race became weak, slavery ensued, and the black woman involuntarily became the mother of the world, as he put it. But he looks forward to the time when the race would again rise, and when the black woman would, would again be able to enjoy a situation of, um, uh, of dignity and respect. This question of the dignity of women was one which you know, was the very beginning of the UNIA here in Jamaica in 1914. The following clause appeared in the Constitution, the aims and objects, sorry, of the UNIA. Here was one of the aims and objects, quote, to rescue the fallen women of the island from the pit of infamy and vice. That was one of the aims and objects of the UNIA at the beginning. And again, this isn't that strange because other conscious individuals elsewhere in the Caribbean were also addressing that problem at the time. Apparently the problem of prostitution was a fairly widespread problem, at least in the larger, in the larger towns and cities in the Caribbean. I've seen similar references in, in the press in Trinidad for, for around this period. So Gavi was very much in the tradition of reformers at that time who were upset at the prostitution, the rampant prostitution among black women in this country. When Garvey returned to Jamaica in the 1920s and early 30s, there was at least one occasion on which he had cause to protest against what he called the ragged and half-naked condition of the female banana carriers on the wharves, the women who loaded bananas. He said that very often tourists, you know, would delight in taking photographs of these, ha these half-naked women as they um, loaded, you know, the bananas on the ships and so on. And, and this distressed Garvey greatly and, and he um, protested against this. Now Gavi, oh, she did so much, she tried to build a nation. The UNIA was a nation in microcosm, and it addressed itself to every aspect that a nation should. It had its parliament, it had its ambassadors in a very literal sense. It had its paramilitary arm, it had its economic base. It also had its cultural expressions. And so Gavi, five minutes more? Okay, and so Gavi endures to a very great extent in the whole question of culture, and, you know, literary criticism and so on. And I'm not sure why this should be, but many of the poets, particularly, of the Garvey movement tended to be women. The most prolific poet of all was a woman called Ethel True Dunlap from uh, Chicago, later on from Los Angeles. And the themes which they um, put forward, both these women and men, very often included subjects dealing with women. The Black is Beautiful theme, for example, was a very common theme. There were themes of the new Negro woman standing up against white oppression and so on. This was a very common theme. One of Afro America's greatest sculptors, a woman, Augusta Savage, was a member of Garvey's organization and she you know, um, participated in the, in the artistic work. In fact, she did some busts of Garvey, some bronze busts. And I keep saying that somebody in the attic or the basement in the United States has a bronze bust of Garvey done by Augusta Savage, and if they find it, they will be into a little nest egg, a little windfall. I'm about to end, uh, I don't know, I have about two minutes, but I can't end without, without saying at least a little something about Garvey's two wives. Garvey was so unique, not only in having two wives, not simultaneously, but consecutively, <laughs> but he was, well, some might say simultaneously, but he was lucky not only in having two wives, but in having two wives who were both some very powerful women in their own rights, you know, even apart from their involvement in Garvey's organization. Amy Ashwood, who he met here in 1914 at the tender age of 17, I've described her as a very precocious person as she was, because at the age of 17, she was a powerful enough speaker to impress Garvey, you know, by her participation in a debate at the East Queen Street 
but it's a literary union one, one night. And this is what attracted, attracted her, apart from her physical beauty, her, her ability as a public speaker. She accompanied Garvey around Jamaica and later on around the States as well. She was one who, who was a, an, an officer in the Black Star Line in the Negro Factories Corporation and so on. She was a high officer in every aspect of Garvey's movement. She spoke from the public platforms the way, the way he did. When she broke with Garvey, three months after the marriage, she continued as a major Pan-African figure. She organized women's movements and race movements in a variety of countries, all over West Africa, in Barbados, in England, all over the place. A powerful woman in her own right. Amy Jakes Garvey, of course, concerning whom Rupert and Maureen have, have, have written. An amazing woman in her own right. A very powerful speaker. I remember hearing her speak when she was about what, 76 years old or something at a, a workers' meeting in Kingston, 1972 or 73, I think it was. An amazing speaker. And I, I wondered what she must have been when she was, you know, like when she was 25 and 30 years old. She too spoke from Garvey's platform. She ran the organization almost single-handedly when Garvey was placed in jail and so on. But before Maureen uh, tossed my head off, I want to stop right here. Thank you very much. Yeah.